right, and we're live. Hello, everybody. Yay. Welcome to today's event. We are here to celebrate the uh, arrival of City of the Play God by Sarwat Chada. And in conversation with him, uh, we have Rashni Chakshi, the, uh, whose forthcoming book, Arusha and the City of Gold, um, will be out uh, very soon. It was April, you said? Mm -hmm. April 6th? Um, uh, but I think it seems like from the chat that everybody knows who both of you are. Um, so let me just do the uh, Vanna White section of this and I'll get out of the way. Um, so today's event is going to be an hour long. The first 30 minutes are going to be the two of the authors speaking together. And then I'll pop back on screen and we're going to go through some of your questions. We're not going to get through all 44 um, that you have. But if there's a particular question you really want answered, like upvote the ones that you want. So those will be at the top and those will be the ones I'll get to. Um, so crowdsource here. Um, if you haven't read the book, seems like some of you have, but if you want to get signed and personalized book plates for these books, um, you can see down below, there's a button there for you. And then just to the side of that, there's the ask a question. If you haven't already been able to ask your question, uh, make sure you pop that in there and, and get people to vote on it. Um, and I think that's it. So I'm going to hand it off to uh, both of them. And I'll be back in a little bit. And we'll keep chatting. Thank you. Aha! I have you all to myself. Thanks, Hello, <laughs> every Hello, everybody from the Mysterious Galaxy. I'm Sawat Chadda, and I'm incredibly excited to be here with you guys at my climactic finale of my tour. So I'm expecting all sorts of shenanigans. And so, and yeah, great to see you, Rosh. Good to see you, too. So you guys weren't there, but Sarbat and I were talking earlier, and I told him how I had to redo... My, all my eye makeup, not all my eye makeup. I lost some of it. My cat has been eating my mascara. That's not the issue. But I finished City of the Play God literally a couple hours ago. It is phenomenal. I was just sobbing oh. at the end. I had so many feelings. It was so good. It was so funny. Um, and I just sort of want to rummage around in your brain, if that is okay. Okay, cool. Go for it. Good. Here I go. Um, so, you know, one thing that I really, really loved a lot about City of the Plague God, of course, is that it's the Mesopotamian mythology and the Sumerian mythology. And did you have, did you have a favorite god or goddess or monster when you were researching? This? Oh well, right. Yes. I mean, she's in there, Ishtar, and it was just like she was so perfect. She's uh, for funny. the story <laughs> and well exactly and the idea that you know she runs the oldest dating agency in history was <laughs> so it was one of those things where I thought right you know how would it be if like you know god this sounds really bizarre but a character from sex in the city was also the greatest warrior in all of existence and that was kind of just uh, <laughs> i've watched the odd episode let me put it that way yeah and so that sort of uh, but yeah it's was just so much great fun to write and for those of you who don't know about Mesopotamian mythology and why should you? Um, Ishtar is the goddess of love and war. And yeah. so you take the idea of Aphrodite meet Ares, same person. And the, <laughs> the whole little running in jokes that, you know, she invented the little black dress for Chanel. And so just a chance for me to put all of that in. But then also she is, yeah, she's the goddess of war. And I just thought that's the most fascinating juxtaposition imaginable so yeah ishtar was like yeah she was okay. i think after sick and i think even yeah before bellet i knew she was gonna come in she was perhaps one of my most favorite characters i've read in a book in the past like couple years honestly she was hilarious all of the stuff about it if someone would just listen to me <laughs> we would not be in these situations and you're welcome for all these various things that i have done for you um there's this passage and it's not super super spoilery 
But when we're when um, Sick is in Ishtar's home and he's looking at all these various portraits of her, the Toulouse Lautrec moment, the <laughs> Da Vinci moment, and I just could not have been more obsessed with her as a person and her love of Jimmy Choo's. I was actually looking at a pair of Jimmy Choo's yesterday, and I was like, you know, I need to understand this this violent love of designer shoes. It leads me down dark, mysterious paths as well, so I can relate. <laughs> Well, um, I mean, it wasn't something I consciously intended when I started writing a City of the Play God, but I don't know, it just like seemed so right. And, you know, oh God, we had like fashion magazines that I was flicking through at the, for the research. And so, yeah, on the one hand, you can do research by going to libraries and then you can go to museums, which I did to do. But on the other hand, you can just grab as many copies of Vogue from your news agent, just think, yeah, that's how Ishtar would dress. Those are the accessories she'd have. And it was like, yeah, it was great fun. But and of course, the opposite to that is I wanted to, you know, Nurgle the big bad. And of course, yeah. he had to be the dima diametric opposite of all things she represented. And mm -hmm. also, I felt it was like slightly tragic in a way yeah. that it's implied that they are the last two that are left. Mm -hmm. All the other Mesopotamian gods have faded away. And it's now just Ishtar and I suppose, yeah, love and war and and disease yeah. which is the bizarre thing because i wrote in 2018 i thought right what would be the most devastating thing that could happen so yeah if this rampaging disease went through society then nobody could stop but that's pure fantasy i can do it any way i like and then you know 2020 hit yeah yes Ugh. you know i when i was i i always loved the relationship between Ishtar and Arash Kigal and the stories and I was obsessed with it was almost this like flipped Hades and Persephone setup of how Arash Kigal and um and Nurgle even got together which I thought was delightful I was wondering if you wouldn't mind summing it up for readers because I think that it is hilarious and a thing that they might appreciate I was always wondering I was like is he gonna work a love story in here too and like this is how divine marriages usually end up uh, ending yes. <laughs> But one of the fun things about the whole book is it's all about sibling relationships. And yeah. so Sick, the main character, it's all about his relationship with his older brother, Mo, mm -hmm. who has who died two years previously and loads of unresolved emotions and feelings Sick has to in a nutshell. Sick ended up always staying at home, working at his parents' deli in New York, while the older brother, Mo, went back to Iraq to help rebuild it after the war. And Mo was always going on the adventures, and he never took Sick along. Yeah. And it was always the idea, oh, maybe I'll go next year, maybe I'll go next year. Mm -hmm. um, but it sadly never happened. Yeah. Oh, you well, know, I'm not going to give any spoilers on that front. And then um, what I thought was great fun was the relationship with between Erish Kagal, who's the older sister, and mm -hmm. Ishtar, who's the youngest, yeah. And mm -hmm. poor Erish Kagal, she is the queen of the underworld. But Ishtar is the glamorous younger sister. And that was what was so fun writing it. You realize, right, these can be the most powerful divine beings in the universe, but they're still bickering because they're still siblings. And I think that's something that sometimes, you know, gets missed in like all these divine relationships when you think or actually you know what they may be the god of thunder or this or that but where's the sibling antagonism and you know nurgle gets thrown into the middle of it so nurgle is erish kagal's husband but if you read the mythologies you know it wasn't the most romantic of <laughs> marriages and relationships. So, you know, they're, they're forced together through necessity than any great love. And you can tell that there's that constant tension because clearly Nurgle doesn't want to stay there. Yeah. And um, it was, but you know what it's like at the end of the day, you can have as many, spectacular scenes or action moments or whatever but the readers are there for the relationships yeah. and the deeper the more sincere the relationships are the 
the more real the characters are and the more the characters live on, hopefully, in the reader's memories. Because I think, yeah, I'm just like that with my older brother or sister or whatever. And yeah, uh, it's that's why I really wanted to focus on with City of the Plague God was basically all the sibling stuff that is the core, I think, of what we are, no matter how old we become, our relationships with our parents and our siblings are still the fundamental things that, that mold us, I think. I think that's beautiful. And I, I love especially what you're saying about how when it comes down to a story, we can have all these cool, shiny little parts. But if we fail to make our readers feel something, we have failed in our mission to tell a good story. Um, and you know, you included some of my, I wouldn't call them tropes necessarily, but certain aspects that I think always make a story kind of sticky to me. Um, I think my favorite character was, and I'm gonna mispronounce this, Kasasu, Kasusu? Yeah, cause, yeah you see, I'd, every time I've asked somebody how you pronounce it, somebody, they've always given me a different answer. So whatever it? works, all right, cause, uh, Oh gosh, now you put me <laughs> Kasusu. Yes. Kasusu. Yes. And um you guys will will meet Kasusu in the story, but they are this sentient angry weapon and is hilarious. There's like that one line like I was there at the Battle of Thermopylae. <laughs> Here I am beheading Leonidas <laughs> and I'm working so hard to like be a good hero, heroine, sword and weapon and you guys are boring and you guys suck. <laughs> it was just, it was the funniest thing. And I think, I think that's one of the beautiful things about revisiting ancient mythology and enlivening it in some way. And that comes down to giving personality traits and personality quirks to things that people wouldn't normally think about, such as what happened to yeah. Excalibur? How did he really feel sitting lying at the bottom of this Welsh lake indefinitely? <laughs> um, so, Thanks. you know, I, especially with all of our wonderful Rick Riordan presents books, our, our companion in arms. I think we always have a battle that we're writing about at something. So I'm actually very curious, if you could bring any ancient weapon into a battle, what would it be and why? Was there, was there something from uh, Mesopotamian mythology that you were just like, oh, absolutely, I would ride into battle with this? Well, this is right. So, um, yes. It's the weapon that Gilgamesh has, the sky cutter, right? <laughs> and you're thinking, that just sounds awesome by itself, the sky cutter, yeah? And that's why I really just loved about it. Yeah, it was a boo-boo, which is this, you know, it's like it is the god weapon. And mm. you discover what Gilgamesh has done with it towards the latter part of the story and it was just you know and when uh sick comments oh you know sky cutter that doesn't sound like that big a deal and the belly is horrified <laughs> that how dare he dismiss you know basically the greatest weapon in all of existence like that yeah. so yeah i mean uh, it was just like and that's what's so much fun is that what does sky cutter mean it doesn't matter really. It just sounds awesome. Yeah. And um and also the fact is that for if anyone knows anything about Mesopotamian mythology, it's gonna be about the epic of Gilgamesh. And yeah. of course, because he he is Mesopotamian mythology, I couldn't not have him. But because he is so colossal that literally and metaphorically I was worried that when he appears, the reader thinks, well, well, that's the adventure sorted. He's just going to basically knock everybody's heads together, game over, and I might as well finish the book. And mm -hmm. so there was a lot of interesting development about his character to make sure that he's still a significant presence, but he doesn't mm -hmm. steal everybody else's thunder. Yeah. Yes. With some a weapon like Sky Cutter, he, he obviously could literally steal everybody's thunder. So yeah. that was what was so much fun. But then, you know, Kasusu was like, I really want to do this Sergeant Major character. Yeah, like, you know, the Marine Drill Sergeant. Yes. That was who I had in, that was the voice I had mm -hmm. in my head when I was writing him. And so it was like just, um, there's so much 
fun to be and you know it better than most to be fun with having mythology because you just interpret it in a way that you because we're bringing it into the contemporary world we've got a certain freedom to reinterpret it how we'd like and then yeah. also view it through the lens of the modern world rather than thinking right we've got to stick religiously to the old myths and not deviate from them and at this there's endless fun to be had there is endless fun to be had, absolutely. And you know, I, I always think that that is in itself a really, really good writing lesson. And I was, I was talking to someone a, a while ago about how what I love about you know City of Play God and of uh, you know Percy Jackson and, and and even Harry Potter too is that what feels really magical to us is when we see the things that seem mundane that all of a sudden gain new life. I mean, the idea of Ishtar running a dating agency or Camp Half-Blood itself and, and like Dionysus as like this weary, resigned, just camp counselor <laughs> being like, I am not paid enough to be here and I wanna, I wanna get out, <laughs> that kind of thing. I would have a drink. Um. <laughs> all these sorts of things I think are, are what brings the story to life um, and especially the side characters. I am just such, I, I think where I really fall in love and get hooked into a story is when the side characters make me love them. Um, especially when they have like just some sad obsession with something like Kasusu and his whole like, we haven't decapitated anybody and it's been a long time and I'm sad. <laughs> um, you know, and another thing that I really, really loved that you talked about um, was, you know, when I think about the Epic of Gilgamesh, it, it has a, it, it actually has a huge amount of real estate in my soul. And I, I blame my dad for that. So um, when my husband and I got married in 2019, my father pitched a fit and he begged and he pleaded that instead of a wedding cake, we would have a wedding ziggurat. Um, oh my gosh, fantastic. And I, was like, I was like, in what world, father, does our combination of a Roman Catholic and Hindu wedding um, meet a stepped pyramid from the days of Shapur the first. And so, <laughs> Actually, you could argue, literally, that would be the middle ground, wouldn't oh it? <laughs> if you measure the distances between the two. <laughs> he would love you. Makes perfect maybe, sense to me. Maybe for my anniversary, I'll try to make a, a ziggurat cake. Do you, is it, when you Go came across the research, was there something that you absolutely loved that you wanted to put into the book that you weren't able to, like some random fact or some cool word like ziggurat? Yeah, right. So um, I'm in a really fortunate position because I live not far from the British Museum. And so I'm just going to be a little bit nerdy here. But <laughs> Mesopotamian mythology was rediscovered in the mid 19th century by British and French archaeologists. Mm -hmm. And for better or for worse, they took a lot of the stuff they found and brought it back, you know, to London and Paris. And so for my entire life, I've been visiting the British Museum and they've got this. So everyone knows about the mummies and the Rosetta Stone and the Elgin marbles. Mm -hmm. But there's a huge permanent exhibit of Mesopotamian friezes from the line hunt of King Ashurbanipal. Mm -hmm. And it is just and what's so funny is that. <laughs> So he was like this great, the last great Assyrian king. Mm -hmm. And he goes out in chariot, fighting lions, conquering kingdoms. But he also has a stylus in his um, in his belt because one of his proudest boats that, you know, I, Ashurbanipal, am a conqueror of the Elamites. I've slain these mighty lions and I'm also fantastic at mathematics. <laughs> 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 I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> and so that's one of his, seriously, that's one of his boasts. And that stylus that he has tucked into his belt is to, you know, say, yeah, because, you know, every now and then I'm just going to sit down, you know, work out the size of the ziggurat, how many, you know, how many stones we need. And like, what, and I just thought that, you know, so there's that bizarre juxtaposition of a world conqueror that's basically really boasting about how he can do trigonometry. I thought, right, I've, that's going to have to appear in book two somehow. I think that is the best thing I've heard 
all week. <laughs> Look upon me and them, mortals, also witnesseth my geometry skills. <laughs> you got, you have got to make that a character and something else. Like, nobody appreciates me. Like nobody asks about my ability. Oh, to, oh. To, to do you see, things. you. Uh, you have to remember, before I became a writer, I, I spent 20 years as an engineer. So mathematics means a lot to me. I didn't know that. That's really cool. I love that. Oh, thanks. And so, yeah, so <laughs> Asher Nepal sort of touches my engineering soul with that boast of his. That's adorable. You know, and the Epic of Gilgamesh is fantastic. And I remember, I can't remember which translation I had read, but I just loved that idea of, What's it all for? And I think there's this line in it, and it was just like, death is reserved for humans. And, and, and when you think about that in the context of these great stories, why do we tell them? And what's the thing that's truly immortal? And I really felt when I was reading City of the Play God that the immortal thing, and I think you even have a line in there, that the thing that really lasts is love down the ages. Um, and that was just such a beautiful thing to read, particularly, you know, just coming out of 2020 and uh, whatever happened last week. So like it just all these things and trying to hold on to that hope. Um, yeah. And, um, go ahead. That meant quite a, right. It's one of those situations where we really underestimate. I think the problem is love has become such a cliche. What does it actually mean? Right. Yeah. And yeah. so we, Sick doesn't have any great superpowers, particularly. He's not an amazing, he's not a fighter at all. He can make a brilliant shawarma. That is the extent of his, you know, expertise. <laughs> and so what was driving him throughout the whole thing, what was driving him was his utter love for his family. Yeah. yeah. And then oh, you expand on that. I mean, actually, while I've again, I don't want to give any spoilers, when but when I first wrote Daoud. In earlier drafts, he was a real peripheral character, and I didn't really know what to do with him. But then all of a sudden, an aspect of a rela his relationship with Muhammad suddenly mm -hmm. became super clear. And actually, Rosh, it completely sorted out the whole story. And you realize all of these things are just all being driven by love. That's really mm -hmm. what motivates every single character every single heroic character in the story and mm -hmm. Bellet's feelings towards her mother and Ishtar struggling with trying to make Bellet her own woman right but Bellet doesn't want to be her own woman he she just wants to be her daughter yeah mm -hmm. and I just you know so and you know when you go into Bellet's chamber and you see all the pictures because I felt that that was an aspect that I really really wanted to explore and of course ended up being the defining attribute of Gilgamesh yes. because you know his relationship with Enkidu Enkidu. is mm -hmm. what drives him yeah mm -hmm. and yeah. so and then you realize that in City of the Play God what the extent of what of what Gilgamesh loves has transformed him yes and i love that and i and i think there's so much there's so much philosophy to be had at the heart of if you if you cannot die how do you truly love or cling to something and how does immortality shape that perspective it's just it's brilliant you you did it all brilliantly and um i know oh, we only have a few Oh, you, you, you knocked it out of the park. I know we have a few minutes before we can get to everybody's amazing questions, but the last thing I have to ask, um, and I can't, the person who was asking, I shouldn't say person, uh, is Teddy, my cat, who was delighted by the amount of cats in City of the God. And I, he earlier was trying to sit on the keyboard and he was so desperate to meet you, but I don't know where he went. Oh. So I suppose I now have to ask, one, do you have a cat? And two, why are there so many cats in this book? <laughs> yes, we have. Right, I don't know. Right, we have Tiger, and he's around here somewhere. somewhere. So yes, we've had a cat. Oh, right, we've had several pets, but the Tiger is part of the family. He's very, very, very much part of the family. So actually, it was a it was a foregone conclusion, and it was also the fact that. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with cats. Yeah, we've got a cat. My sisters, we just, they're just cats. Yeah, but 
my wife is a dog lover and so i'm not neglecting the dog aspects so uh, there was a period where we were dog sitting for a neighbor for a couple of years and that was really sweet too so uh <laughs> but yeah we have cats i love so, that and also there... there's something little eastern about cats and i think it's probably because of the egyptian thing and so yeah. it just it seems a really and also it's a really fun way of introducing the llama sioux and so i yeah. thought that was just yeah it was just i love that as you said you know it's that, as you said earlier, it's the mundane then becoming magical. And um, my cats were the answer to that. Yes, absolutely. Is, is the llama say the same thing as a shedu? Is that the same thing, kind of? Yeah, right. You see, I actually think because Mesopotamian mythology is so ancient, there's so much that has just come out of it. Because I think the Sphinx was mm -hmm. originally a Lama Sioux as well, because it's got exactly the same attributes. Right. And so it's sort of, you know, yeah, I think there's an interconnection with a lot of those mythic beasts and a lot of them, the sources probably originate from Mesopotamia if you probably go back far enough. And this is one of the things that's fantastic about being down at the British, near the British Museum. In the British Museum, there's a stone, um, tablet uh called the flood tablet and it was one of the exercises about translating cuneiform and on this stone tablet is a story of a guy who gets contacted by the gods and told that they're going to wipe out humanity mm -hmm. in a massive flood and it's his yeah. job to build a boat and load as many animals on top of it as possible and that's the first version of the noah myth and so right. you think wow right. there's so much that came out of Mesopotamia that was lost, but it's now bit by bit being, being rediscovered and realizing it's a source for a lot of things. Yeah. Well, you know, I love that you say that because we talk about myths and also cultural traditions. And I think like the, the stories of the great deluge, we have it as an etiological, an etiological story in the Bible with Noah and the, and the Ark. There's an episode of it um, in ancient Hindu mythology. And I really, really love how they seem to sort of I don't know mythology and the sacred they're like palimpsest you know like you see sketches of things like gilgamesh and his and his ziggurat and the tower of babel i feel like those are whispers of something similar you know um so it's always it's just so cool that you're playing with the, of the mythology that's so old <laughs> I was actually, it was, this actually goes back to the very beginning, which is something that I want to quick, briefly mention before we go on to the Q&A, mm -hmm. is that when I was asked to join Rick Ride and present, my first impulse was I wanted to do a Muslim protagonist. So that actually was the starting point. But because in a lot of fantasy stories, if you say, right, it's going to be a, 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 a character of Muslim heritage, it always ends up being the Arabian Nights. And so it's going right. to be Jean, it's going to be. And so what took me a long time was to find some a new angle because I I love the Arabian Nights, but I couldn't think of anything fresh or new to bring to it that hadn't already been done. And so, but what was so funny was when I realized, wow, there is the oldest mythology in the world comes out of the Middle East. It was that real eureka moment where yeah. all of a sudden it became so, so clear. And you think, yeah, I'll just go to the absolute source. It's going to be the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's going to be all these gods that um, you could almost say are forerunners of all the, a lot of the Near Eastern and certainly Mediterranean mythic gods that we all know and love so yeah it was a real yeah it was a real eureka moment tying the muslim character to mesopotamian mythology i just loved it just loved it loved it oh loved thank it. you <laughs> and i guess on that note we can turn to some questions right looks like we've got <laughs> more than 50 to go <laughs> hi again hello um i'm back hey Matt. hey um it was so cool hearing you guys talk about the like the echoes of mythology through the years and i i want to start out with one question of my own although i'm sure it's buried in there somewhere um if you could have any crossover with any of the other of the uh the rick riordan presents uh what universe would you cross over into right you see the thing is 
Mm. Rosh and I have a little common background because I've also done Indian mythology back in the day. And so part of me would still be tempted to revisit that. And so <laughs> and the thing is, it sounds so sort of crawlery. But I've, for me, I think there's certain aspects of because you know i wrote from the ramayana put you know characters from the it. ramayana of course you've done the mahabharata yeah <laughs> and for me characters like karna are still so badass oh yeah. my I god there's yes. still endless stories yes. to be you know explored on that and so so part of me's hoping right so we have an editor called stephanie right and so if rosh ever decided right i'm going to step back from writing indian mythology i've got other things to be doing and steph would say please 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 <laughs> i would be leaping in this jumping up and down in the background i'll have a go, I'll yeah, have it's, a go. Your turn. it's your turn well you know that's <laughs> the wonderful thing about the things that we get to write i mean like it's we I feel like we say this a lot, um, you know, but one person of color voice is we're not a monopoly. We all have a different angle. We all have a different a different thing to bring to the table. So absolutely all the Hindu mythology all the time, especially because my mom, who is Filipino, is getting kind of mad at me. So uh, it's, uh, I got to I got to oh. <laughs> I got to do something else or she'll stop feeding me. I'll be sad. So <laughs> oh, please, please keep feeding you, uh, Roshni's mom. <laughs> please, mommy. I'm all right. It's like, you know, ghost story. I'm doing my best. But um, yeah, if I could jump into somebody else's book, I feel like I definitely want to wander around and go shopping with Ishtar. I feel like we would have a ball. Um, and that would be fabulous. It would be the, just the greatest pairing. Um, and then I'm, I, I'm a huge, huge fan of Jen Cervantes' Stormrunner books. And I think that wandering around in some cool divine hotel uh, speaks to me on a deep spiritual level. Yeah. I just want to like sip mezcal with the gods. So. <laughs> right. It's funny because you mentioned Jen. What speaks to me from Jen's book is there's a goddess of chocolate. Yes. Ish cacao, I think. Right? I think. We're gonna say that that's up. Anyway, questions. Well, this is <laughs> this is our um, subtle plug to say read all of these books from the yes. uh, Rick Riordan presents because <laughs> they um, they're all so good and like so diverse and that's really important right now. Um, so the first one is, what is the weirdest or if you don't have a weird one, what's best fan interaction that you've had since you both uh, are pretty prolific writers. I'm sure you have plenty of fans. Okay. The best one that I had was my very, very first book, and that was 2009. So I think it's because it was so early on, it made such a big impact. But I was doing a school event. There was a long queue of kids, and this was YA, so older kids. And this kid came with my book, dropped it on the table, and says, this is the first book I've read all the way through in my entire life and that mm -hmm. was just bloody epic that was <laughs> yeah. yeah and I so it's that. really yeah and i was just like that's that's the best compliment i will ever ever have i think and so yeah. that's the word yeah that's by far yeah the best interaction that's so I, sweet i love that i love and unfortunately now to to go off of that beautiful thing i have to say that my weirdest fan interaction was when i was asked to sign someone's toilet and they just like walked into the line i can't remember where i was and they just had a toilet around their head so i signed that like the seat yeah wow it was a moment i was like I'm like holding my my pen like at a distance, being like, "Where did you get it from?" <laughs> I just really disturbed. But other than that, I think favorite my, my favorite think... moments for the readers is um you know when you guys dress up as my characters, uh, I I die. <laughs> like it makes me so happy and just so just so incredibly humbled. But yeah, the toilet thing I'll never forget that. <laughs> I do love the uh, the bookstagram kind of the aesthetics that people do of like taking covers and then turning it into like makeup and looks. Um, that's been a really cool thing to discover as I get into bookstagram. Um, all right, so question for Sarwat: uh, Is City of the Play God a standalone, or will there be a second book? 
I have such plans. I have such epic plans. So it's a standalone now. However, it totally depends on you guys. If sales are good, there will be other books. It is the the most. Um, I've got. I'm quite confident that there will be others but it's really early days it only came out on tuesday so folks just remember this is the book that you are looking for um, buy it for yourself buy it for friends buy it for family buy it for the stranger you pass every day on the street it will flower into a beautiful friendship i'm sure so yeah um if the book does well there will be other books it's as simple as that um and then one for roshni uh, are the relationships and friendships in Arusha similar to ones that you have in real life? Yes, and I am deeply, enormously grateful for that. I'm very, very close to my baby sister. I'm close to my sister-in-law. Um, I've got like a good group of girlfriends around me and they just lift me up and steal my clothes. So I'm grateful for them. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the mark of a good friendship is when you can just really? take people's clothes. Uh, yes, that's really it. <laughs> Um, for both of you, are there any books or shows that you like that you would recommend to us? Ooh. Right. I've just started watching The Great, which is about Catherine the Great. Have either of you seen it? Love it. Love it so much. It's so fun. It, so I, it's only just started in Britain, so I've only seen up to the first two episodes. Yeah, and so it is just hysterical, but it's so clever as well. So, um, and it's, right, so my wife is much more into the Jane Austen type of traditional costume dramas. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's not saying I'm not into costume dramas as well, but normally my costume dramas involve Vikings. Um, so actually it's brilliant that we've found like a little, uh, brilliant little middle ground. So I'm watching The Great and I've got actually the end of season six of Vikings to watch as well. And oh, the other thing, Cobra Kai season, you know, so I've seen the first two seasons. I'm saving season three for a weekend binge watch. So Cobra Kai, Great, The Great, and Vikings. Those are the three. I would have to say, I mean, I'm sure everyone's already seen Queen's Gambit, but it just really does, it just makes me really happy. And I just, I feel like I'm on my second rewatch of that. I'm on my fourth rewatch, perhaps, of Ted Lasso, which is absolute joy. And if you need serotonin, watch Ted Lasso. If you're over 17, you watch Bridgerton's. Um, and, uh, I think those are pretty much my, oh, Magicians is one of my favorite shows. And I think it has some of the best writing. Uh, I think a couple of the seasons are now on Netflix and it's totally finished. So I really loved that. It was sort of like, it was, I mean, it's a magic school. It's dark, it's delightful. And um, sometimes the episodes are musicals. That's my pitch. Uh, we just finished Bridgerton and um, Queen's Gambit <gasps> in the last week or so. Um, and my wife commented that The Great is really good, so I must have seen some of that at some point. Uh, but it's hard to keep all of the the Catherine the Great and all of those shows separate because um, there's there's so many good ones out there of, of those uh, that time period right now. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um, this is pretty open. So take it how you want, but what are your views on Percy Jackson? I don't know if it's the character or the books. Um, we would uh, not be here. Actually, that's quite Jackson. interesting. Because, <laughs> yeah, so there's like there's the there's the big global answer, isn't there? That Rick Ryden presents wouldn't exist yeah. if it wasn't for Percy Jackson. And I don't ah. Oh, Actually, this goes back to something I remember from ages ago. There's visiting a local bookshop and speaking to the bookseller who I knew really, really well. And we got onto the subject of, and I think I didn't know Rick by then, you know, at that point. So it's still quite early days. And she was saying how many kids are coming to Greek mythology now and mythology generally because of Percy Jackson. While I was always under the impression, oh, right, they've read, you know, Hercules and Jason, and now they've picked this up. No, it's completely, completely the other way. And so I grew up loving, I still love Greek myths and all of that. So if there's 
if it brings more to the fold, then that is fantastic. But also representation, because mm -hmm. Rick's characters especially, and actually this is something that meant a lot to me like you know he's been a great advocate of lgbtqa characters in his mid-grade books and that has made an impact on millions of children and actually adults parents everything because that's a level of representation being brought in by one of the biggest children's writers in mm -hmm. the world and he's not thinking oh right you know i might upset this person or that person no and this is i think something that's quite important about writing unless you're writing sincerely you should actually often you should question why you're actually doing it right yeah, because absolutely. it takes a, the impact you can make on you know make on people especially in mid-grade because they're becoming confident readers and in a way you're potentially fashioning the adult that they're going to become and if they feel that they've got the likes of percy and annabeth and everything have got their back and they belong to that clique that's that's amazing that is really amazing i think sarah literally had the best answer i, I can't even add anything more to that i mean rick is Rick is a, a wonderful human being. Percy Jackson is the sort of thing that I'm just really, really glad that it exists. I'm glad that it sparked um, that it sparked kids to to be curious about what else was out there, what else might these mythologies have engaged with, and it's just been such a joy to be part of Rick Riordan Presents. Nice. Those are both very sweet answers, and it seems like the chat agrees with you. Um, <laughs> they love Uncle Rick. Oh yeah, uh, we get to be uncle things too because someone once called me Aunt Rosh and I'm not <laughs> done with that. I actually prefer to be Uncle Rosh. So if we could just like do that, that would be fine with me. We will submit your complaint to the internet. Yes. Uh, there, was a, there was one time a couple of years ago where I, try, I just got annoyed and I was like, I just want people to call me daddy, which doesn't work now in 2021. But Marie Rakowski did it on a panel and I blushed for 10 hours. I was like, never mind. Nobody called me that. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I don't know. That's probably not appropriate. Next question. <laughs> um, so a couple questions on craft. Um, how do both of you go through the process of choosing character names and, and traits and developing those? Ooh. Uh, I deal right, with... <laughs> go ahead. Go on. Off to you. Oh, I was going to say, I, I steal them from people I love and hate in equal measure. But I I think sometimes <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, there's some of my husband's ex-girlfriends that, well, anyway, but that's not the point. <laughs> but just, so, I think that when it comes to personality traits, giving even especially a side character, give them either a phrase or one thing to obsess over. And they be, they take life in a whole different way. Um, there's a a moon bird in Arusha and the Tree of Wishes that I absolutely adore, mostly because you know he's in love with moonlight, but he gets confused about what's moonlight. So he's in love with like um, car headlights and the, the light off an iPhone phone and random flashlights that campers leave behind. And he's just adorable. And I would just lay my life down for the sad, dumb moon bird. And when I think about traits like that, that's the sort of thing that I think about, um, to give them an obsession that is ridiculous and yet means the world to them. So. Uh, my, right, so the main character is called Secunda, right? And that worked on several levels. First of all, it abbreviates to sick. And considering it's a story about disease, I thought that would, you know, in fit neatly. But also, Secunda is the Arabic for Alexander. Mm -hmm. And Alexander the Great, he died in Babylon. He died in Ishtar's capital city. He died in mm -hmm. Mesopotamia. And also, Alexander means defender of the world. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a lovely symmetry to all of that. And so um, it was... <sighs> I, I don't know whether I'd researched it or I came up with it and it ended up just being a happy coincidence. I like to imagine I'm so clever, I'm so wise. I just came up with the name sick and it just fit perfectly on all levels instantly. But um, I think about, I mean, Rosh, do you really plan your main character's names or does just one pop out and you think, right, that'll do. I'll come up with something better later on. And then by the time you finish, that's, that's their name? 
Uh, to me, names are, I take the naming of stuff very seriously. And I tried, I tried my best to kind of have, if I couldn't have, um, cause you know, like all the Bandava sisters are reincarnations of the actual Bandava heroes from the Mahabharata. So if I couldn't have the name sound similar, like Aru, Arjun, Bhim, Bryn, um, at least I tried yeah. to match it up in terms of, um, the meaning of each person's name. And so I did, I did what I could, <laughs> but I think, I think sometimes I struggle with the names. I, I struggle with drafting. If I don't have the right name, I find that I can't keep going. Like there's something, it's like writing with a, with a broken arm. Be the same way with titles. Like you have to have the title ahead of time or. No, my I'm so bad at titles. I think I was actually taken off an email chain as my agent and editor were discussing <laughs> titles. And I was just sitting there in the background like, hello? Does anybody want my opinion? Hello? So, and the answer was a resounding no. So that's fine. What about you, Sarwan? Do you have titles in I'm mind? Same, yeah. I hate I hate thinking. I hate trying to think up titles. I've Oh, my gosh. I don't think I've thought up a title for any of my books. <laughs> so first book, actually, no. Out of the 11 books I've written, I've thought the title of one of them. <laughs> it's as simple wow. as that. <laughs> my agent thought up the first book. I thought up the second. Uh, my daughters thought up the Shadow Magic trilogy. And um, maybe I thought up the City of the Play God. But even then, I was just thinking, oh, right. I'm just not sure I want it to be the city. But I need Play God in there. Oh, I don't know. Oh, to be honest, it makes me feel anxious even discussing it now. Because I think, oh, <laughs> should it have been another title? So let's move swiftly on. Okay. <laughs> um, another craft question. Um, and this one's pretty open as well. What is something weird that you do while you're writing? Like, do you have any quirks about how you have to have things set up or things you have to eat while you're writing to get into you know, your headspace. Well, I'm trying to eat less chocolate when I'm writing. Let's put it that <laughs> way. And so, um, but, oh, interesting. Okay, right. Actually, bear with us for a sec. I'm just going to reach over to my shelf. I will be back in a second. Right. <laughs> Oh, I love show and tell. It's always great. I can't do show and tell. My cat abandoned me. That was my one. That was my one trick. <laughs> no, no warmth for you. I know. <laughs> oh my god! So all my books start with a big sheet of paper on the wall where I throw up all my ideas, and so that. I cannot start a book any other way. It's got to be that big sheet of paper. And I was speaking to Rosh earlier. My background is, oh, actually, I think I mentioned it to all of you. My background was engineering. And so I used to do designs on huge sheets of paper. And that's how I still, uh, that's how I design my books. It's funny. I think there's a lot of engineering stuff about design that I've actually adapted to, 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 storytelling and assembling books i love how brilliant and intelligent that answer is <laughs> and then once more i'm going to follow up with like with your with your hard-hitting compassionate thing of the child this is the first time you could read a book full through and through and i'm like i find a toilet um i i eat coffee grinds i don't know why i i haven't been able to stop doing that it's been six years so, oh my They're God, like, where did go? He left us. He'll come back. Probably have like a. Well, oh, good. He didn't have to hear that embarrassing answer. But it's not like I'm eating like used coffee grinds. It's not like I okay. make coffee and then like dig through like the sludge and remnants and like, ooh, yum. That's horrible. Um, I don't do I was going to ask. Yeah, no, that would be like really upsetting. I don't know. I, I think it's a texture thing. And I like, I like chewing on bitterness as I write. So. They have yeah. like chocolate covered coffee beans. Um, that would have been better. I wish that was which, my answer. Well, I mean, you can still use your answer. It's too late. Uh, I can't lie. I say, those are really good. They got the bitter um, and you are wired after a handful. It's just take sure. it easy. Yeah. I don't know. Um, so he should be back soon. Sorry, what? Come back. We miss you. Um, I've got a question here for you while we wait. Okie doke. 
Um, what is Aru Shah's favorite Bollywood movie? And will you be writing, um, you talked about this a little bit, more series and Indian fantasy based books to come because uh, Nikita is here for it. Oh, thank you, Nikita. Um, let's see. Uh, Aru Shah's favorite movie. She loves watching Bahubali with her friends. Bahubali is the greatest. But when she's by herself, um, she watches Joe the Akbar and she cries over the love story and she tells absolutely nobody <laughs> that sometimes she thinks that Aiden looks a little bit like Ruthie Roshan and then she'll just like quietly just go sit in a closet and think about her feelings. So that's that. Um, as for more books, I honestly think that with this fifth book, that it is the it is all I have to say right now about Aru and her adventures. But there is definitely other things that I that I want to talk about. I just don't know how yet. Um, and I've I've got this I've got this idea for a almost like spirited away Filipino folktale story thing that I can't quite shake from my head, and I owe my mom a story. So. Hopefully that will be next. That sounds really cool. I love Spirited Away. So if that's uh, yeah, it makes me so happy. I just yeah. you know, I'm always thinking about how in stories uh, the the parents are absent. Actually, there was something I wanted to talk to Sarwat about because the sick has both of his parents and they're loving people <laughs> versus like that's not a thing that I seem like capable of writing and it, it has annoyed my parents for a while. They're just like why are why are we like not both there? I'm like well because you would probably stop me from being able to go on quests or you would ask me like, did I pack extra socks and such? Nobody wants to deal with such mundane trivialities when they're questing about or saving the world. Um, and so I, I wanted to write a book with parents in it, but like maybe not parents in it the way that we would imagine. So. That's a very fair point. I mean, I know that, you know, Disney often doesn't have like parental involvement in their stories. It would be so funny. I mean, well, the other thing is that with Asian fantasy, parental involvement just is like, hey, where the heck do you think you're going? Get back here, drag by your <laughs> hair. You're just like, ow. So the end, sad. <laughs> um, uh, Sarwa is not reconnecting. I have re-invited him. Hmm. But he is, he's still not popping up. Hmm. Sarwa, come back or I'll just... Tell sad stories or something. I can answer another question while I've got. Oh, there he is. Oh, you're here. I was about to start singing and dancing. Everybody would have been upset. <laughs> oh, not RIP. RIP. I'm back. back. So, anyway, can you see me? Yes, but you are echoing a bit. I don't know if that's just me. No, echoing. Um, I don't know what's happening. Right. I don't, I don't know, know what, what else, else I, I can do. do. Are you on too screen badly. badly? Nope, nope. You know, I saw someone in the chat no, no. that maybe you were a prophet or an oracle, and now you really have the oracle voice. <laughs> say something ominous. My prediction for 2021 is... I'll just be too much. much. Uh, uh, well, let's. We'll keep the Oracle theme going for the rest of this. We've only got a couple more minutes. <laughs> God, you sound so funny and ominous. Like literally, like you were the. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, go on. the demise. Ask, ask me a question. question. All right. Ask, ask me a question. question. Go, go on. Then. What's the next, next question? question? What was the biggest struggle for you writing this book, and how did you overcome it, Sarwan? Deadlines. deadlines so <laughs> when, when I, I was first um, I, was I was lucky, lucky that, that I, was I was able, able to send to Rick Rick and, the and the editor, editor a, proposal a proposal of four chapters, chapters to give them, to an, give idea them an idea of the tone, of the tone and, and, and an outline, outline. But, but then when, when I think we were first meant to publish it in 2022, 2022. So, I so I thought I had bags, bags of time, of time. Can you still say I'm going to get a lot of money in 2021? <laughs> I don't know. I just want to hear that. Go of it. You shall. Right. You shall. Okay. Right. You, okay. shall all, you shall have all a glorious, have a glorious 2021. 2021. The Oracle Sarwat has, has spoken. spoken. Blessings, Blessings upon, upon you from, from on high. high. 
<laughs> so All right, we're going to Anyway, we'll make that a clip and um <laughs> we'll let you share that out on social media and That's just the best thing. Give everyone that um luck and grace. It's great. Um <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. All right, so for both of you, what is your advice for young budding writers since I think there are a lot of them here? Oh gosh. Well, for young budding writers, I would say read everything. I mean, you know that a, you you hear that a lot, but also don't be afraid to to take ideas from things that are random that just happened. So, for example, Sarwat speaking in his echoing oracle voice just made me think how funny it would be if there was an oracle side character who's really upset because nobody seems to really listen to them because they just keep speaking in double echoing. Everything just sounds unnecessarily epic, and they're just like, I can never go to Starbucks. Nobody listens. Instead, they keep bringing me offerings of goats and stuff to slaughter, and I don't want that. I just want to caramel macchiato. What the hell? Um, that would be my advice, to, to be excited about certain things, to remember that stories are living things, and you can flip them around and poke holes in them and see what happens when you hold them up to the light and, then, and, and things stream through it. Yeah, that's my advice. The advice, the advice of, of the, the oracle, oracle is, is this. this. Pay, Pay attention, attention, O mortals. Thou shalt finish what thy has started. The most important words in a story are the end. The oracle has spoken. This was so good. I can't imagine, like, this is the most epic ending of a panel that I've ever been on. I, and this is this is the end of the tour. <laughs> the end of the tour. It was great. Yeah. It, yeah. it is. It is. I shall now I shall return, now return back, return to, back the to the realm from which I came. Which I came. <laughs> Sorry, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All right, what are we doing on time here? Let's see. So we've got about two minutes. So I think that unfortunately is going to be the end of the questions. Um. We asked it a little bit, but do either of you have anything else coming up that you'd like to promote um, outside of uh, these two series? Uh, I've written a lot of stuff. Check out my website. If you want National Treasure Without Nicolas Cage, you can read The Gilded Wolves. You want Hades and Persephone, but with Indian mythology, there's Star Touch Queen. Um, read all the Rick Riordan Presents books. They're absolutely phenomenal. Please get out there and buy City of the Play God. It's Literally in my top five of the year. I could not love this book more. Huge congratulations, Sarah. It's a triumph. Oh, thank you so much, Rosh. That really means a lot to me. So, yeah, um, I've, I've written, written YA. YA. There's There's a, a, if, you're if you're into, into the, Knights the Knights Templar, Templar check out The Templar's Daughter. And so, so that, that would be my recommendation, recommendation of my, my other, other books. books. So, so, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I don't know, I don't what, know else what else to say, to say apart, apart from, from may the may blessings, blessings of the oracle be upon, upon you all, and may your achievements be noble, may you walk the path of righteousness, and um, yeah, be excellent to each other and party on, dudes, because I'm a big Bill and Ted fan. <laughs> oh, <sorry. Well, laughs> I want to thank both uh, Sarwa and Roshni so so much this has been such a fun conversation i've learned so much and so many books to go read now um i think everyone else does so um so you don't have to go outside the house make sure you order them from the link below get those signed and personalized book plates um you can order all these books that we've talked about all the rick riordan presents are available and you know reading is the best thing you can be doing right now i think true sure. Sure, sure, sure. So yeah. with that, I'll sign off. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And Thank you guys. we hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. Take care. Take care. Thank, you, thank, thank, you, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Bye.